Hey everybody, welcome back to the Hit or Die podcast, episode 63. Uh, joining us today is assistant coach at Fresno State, Greg Gonzalez. Uh, was a cappuccino, cap, cappuccino. Cappuccino High School. Cappuccino High School. Uh, from there to Skyline. Uh, two years or? Uh, three years. Three years. years there, right? Three years. And then transferred to Fresno State and had an outstanding career as a Bulldog. And was drafted in the 15th round by the San Diego Padres. Uh, played a couple seasons professionally there. And then went on to coach uh, at Skyline for a little bit. And then I think Santa Clara too, right? Mm-hmm. And then Fresno State. And then Fresno State. So we're going to get into it. But uh, I always, I just pulled a Chad. We, I, you always forget the yeah, I always, I always, I Nobody Chad cares always, about yeah, us. Yeah, nobody cares. <laughs> Chad always forgets to do it. And that's why we did an intro. And so we don't have to forget to do it. And I always give him shit about forgetting to do it. And I forgot to do it. Uh, but join us, Greg Gonzalez. Thanks, man. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. i um, been listening to you guys for quite a long time. And uh, it's an honor to be on here. And you guys had some great, great guests and putting out some great content. So I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Um, yeah, I went to uh, Cappuccino High School. That's in San Bruno, California. Um, uh, shoot, man. Uh, actually, it was almost cut my freshman year. My buddies still give me a hard time about it to this day, how they uh, the coach wanted to cut me. And um, and they basically said, no, nah, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. And kept me on the team. Uh, you know, we were, we're just a nice little public school. Uh, won a couple of our league championships when I was a junior and senior. Um, and I was, I was an all-league player as a shortstop. Didn't pitch too much uh, back then. Kind of just, you know, when we needed a couple extra innings or had an extra game that week. Um, but, yeah, I was an all-league uh, shortstop, expected to go on to uh, call it junior college, really, and and try and play infield somewhere, try and hit, try and transfer out of there. And um, really got to start pitching because uh, a friend of mine who was just our – he was our number one ace. He was a pretty good player. Um, he went to Mexico for the summer. So for our summer league, they said, hey – um, we're going to need you to pitch once a week. Can you handle that? I said, sure, fine. And, uh, you know, I don't know what happened, but just kind of my arm strength started showing up and, um, really dominated that summer and kind of ended up going from a guy that was, you know, just, you know, trying out for the team and, and doing all that to probably the number one pitching recruit that they had for, for Skyline Junior College. And we had about four, four junior colleges right in that area within 25 minutes of each other. And, uh, wasn't recruited by any of them, not a phone call, not a talk after a game or anything. And, um, you know, ended up going up to skyline and, um, had a couple good years. Um, first year, I think started out pretty rough. I had a, I had a pretty hard time, um, you know, going to just pitching and, and getting into that role and accepting that. And so I think it was probably my last five games really started doing well. Um, started putting up some really good numbers strikeouts wise and, and wins wise and um, ended up becoming a uh, All-American for the junior college level. I was a conference pitcher of the year. Um, and then after that, you know, I had to start to get a little bit of hype, started to get some schools calling me uh, going into my sophomore year. And actually first game of my sophomore year, um, fifth inning of the game, uh, had a collision with my catcher on a swinging bunt and tore my ACL. Uh, and um and so ended up missing that season and actually uh the funny part about it was i was probably two weeks out from surgery still crutching around we were playing one of our rival schools and uh i run into a coach uh, it ended up being matt curtis he was coming out who was a fresno state assistant at the time he's coming out of the uh the stadium he was watching a player for the other team who ended up coming to fresno state uh zach bischoff good friend of mine and uh and he introduced himself. He's like, you know, hey, man, we really want to see you this year, but, uh, you know, we'll check you out later. And that was really kind of the low point of, of the whole injury thing. Like, man, like I just I just missed an opportunity. You know, they'll probably never be back. And so um, did my rehab, did a really good job with that, had a personal trainer that was um, that really got me in great shape, really got me back to uh, back to normal strength wise and um, actually better than better than normal strength wise and came in and had, a, had another good sophomore year. Uh, was getting recruited by quite a few schools and um, and actually had a little bit of a weird process with all that, but uh, you know ultimately ended up signing with Fresno State. I think probably right around July before uh, before my my fall of two thousand nine. Can you get into a little bit of the uh, scholarship, uh, like recruiting wise? Uh, how what was so weird about the situation? 
Yeah. So, um, you know, after my after my freshman year, I was getting a lot of calls and things like that, and um, a lot of schools with interest. I just want to see a little bit more, and then um, was having a pretty good season. And actually, a, a rival junior college that I had done pretty well against had a good relationship with a with a pretty big time school. I'm, I won't say their name, but um, basically, they started calling me. We talked for a couple of weeks. They offered me a scholarship, a significant scholarship, and I um, and I accepted it on the phone. And I just said, "Hey, man, like I'd love to see the school." Um, I'd love to see the school and, uh, you know, I'll pay my own way out there. It can be an unofficial visit, but I just want to know what I'm getting into, but I'm in, you know, it was that, it was that good of an opportunity for me. And, um, and the coach is like, yeah, sure, man. Um, we'll call you next week. Um, you know, we can only talk to you once a week, which is a rule and, uh, we'll call you up and we'll, we'll set it up. We'll pick a weekend, something like that. And next, the next week comes, don't hear from him. Okay. I'll, I'll call him. Uh, that went on for about three weeks. And then finally I had said, you know, forget it. It's, uh, um, you know, if they're not going to call me back or whatever, it's, it's probably not going to happen. So I never actually did hear from them again. And then, um, that's just, they, they offer you a scholarship, mm -hmm. you accept it. And then they don't talk to you. Did yeah, you ever play just, against them? No, we didn't. Um, and actually I got really excited cause, cause, uh, my senior year, they put out a schedule and I saw their team initials on it and thinking that it was them, but it was actually another school that we ended up playing, but I always wanted to, I always wanted to, we were actually, we were supposed to play them this year, but didn't for quite, all you guys out there, you can it. try to guess who that who it is. <laughs> we don't even know. Yeah, uh, but we'll find out. We'll find out later. later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, what was it that got you to Fresno State? I mean, Curtis obviously reached back out to you, and and yeah. So that's that's uh, kind of where it gets a little little funny. I had um, I sent out uh, an email at the end of our end of our season with just my stats and stuff, and kind of rethought what what do I want out of a college program. And uh, probably the school that was probably my number one school based on those things, they, they reached out, they came out, they watched me throw a bullpen, offered me a really good scholarship. Um, and I was in, my parents were in, everybody was happy. Um, and then because I would, they were a private school. And since because I had taken that third year of uh, junior college, I technically didn't meet the requirements, even though I had my grades were all in line, everything was good. I didn't meet their requirements. And so this was probably like, you know, June 20th or something. And I had a couple other, um, couple other schools on me, neither of which I wanted to go to. I was just like, man, like I'm really, I'm really don't want to do this. Um, but you know, my parents were like, well, where are you going to go? Where are you going to, what are you going to do? Um, you know, we got to get something set up because you're, you're not just not going to go to school next year. So I'm like, man, okay. So I actually, one of those schools, um, sent me a letter of intent and I got it in the mail. And, uh, I, actually, I think it was, the day after, um, when I was still, I told him I'm still thinking about it. And uh, the day after, I got a call from uh, Matt Curtis uh, to to uh, see if I was still available. And um, I guess the story goes, though, from what what he told me is um, he was at a an event with these coaches, the one that the school that I couldn't go to because of the grades, and the school that had sent me the letter of intent. And um, and the story goes that the school that I that I wanted to go to got off the phone with me and kind of said, "Hey, I guess I guess he's going to go to you, um, to the other guy." And and Curdy was sitting in that you know little scrum. And I guess what had happened with them was they had signed a guy, had to pass a summer school class to come to Fresno State, didn't pass it, and so they had a, a roster spot available. And he like snuck up uh, away from the field, away from those guys, called me. And, um, you know, Fresno State was probably the, the number one school my dad wanted me to go to just because it was close. Uh, they had just won the College World Series and, you know, just we really liked everything about them, but just had never heard from from them again after that uh, that day at Skyline. So um, it was pretty cool for them to do that. And then I told the I told the other schools like, hey, you know, I'm going to weigh out some options. And then I think it was like that weekend met Curdy up here for an unofficial visit and, um, you know, just kind of signed on the line right there. That's crazy. If he, if Curdy's not in that situation, mm -hmm. you probably aren't a bulldog. Probably not. I mean, if he's not sitting there, um, because I think my, you know, my junior college coach kind of exhausted all the options. You know, we had sent out letters to probably like twenty schools. Heard back from a lot of them, um, but it was just a lot of like, well, you know, we'll wait on the draft. And back then, the draft was like they had the draft, and you didn't have to sign until like August fifteenth, and you know, school starts August 18th, you know, yeah. it's like, you know, you're going to lose something. So yeah, if he wasn't there, man, I, I don't know. I don't know where I would have been. I, I, based on the other school and what it was, I, I, and being a pitcher there, it was not, 
an ideal situation for anybody. So uh, I got I got pretty lucky. Now with you, uh, we talked about high school. Uh, we were talking about two sport athletes and whatnot, and you were saying you had an injury your freshman year, uh, which didn't allow you to play another sport. Um, <clears throat> but Skyline's a powerhouse JUCO. What's the – a lot of guys don't understand, like going to junior college – or a four year, do you think you would have been able to handle Fresno State as a freshman? Or do you think going to junior college, you know, helped you grow up a little bit and, um, you know, mentally and physically to, to adjust to Division One? Yeah, no, I, I physically, I probably wasn't where I should have been um, to be at a Division One, but mentally too. I mean, uh, that was one thing Skyline had. I mean, they coached you tough. Uh, Coach Dino Namikos and um, and at the time Coach John Quintel. Man, I mean, um, you know, Coach Batesel has a reputation of being a tough coach. Man, those those two guys are as hard on you as anybody. But it's all it's all for the good of the player. You know, it's just to toughen you up, thicken up your skin. And um, and I needed that. I needed that fresh out of high school and just new perspective. And um, you know, just making sure that you're earning everything. It's just I, I'm a big fan of the JUCO route. I know you went to JUCO as well, and um, you know, I think that that that's the way to get to Division One baseball or the highest level of baseball that you can play. Sometimes is go to a junior college, develop, and then you know down the road, um, you know, see if you have the ability as as a junior or a transferring sophomore or whatever it is. Were you phased out of high school? Like I'm not a, I wasn't a D one guy. Like I hear a lot of D one or well, he wasn't even going to be a pitcher. Yeah, that's true know. too. I'm just saying, like mentally. You know, did you, were you down on yourself at all? Like, I didn't meet my own expectation or, I mean, I, just, I hear a lot of guys with the D1 or bus mindset and, you know, D1's tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, um, honestly, man, that was guys from my area at the time. We had, uh, we had one guy who ended up from our like public school league that went to, um, went to Stanford and he ended up being the number two overall pick a few years later, um, Greg Reynolds. And then even, um, uh, we're right in that area of the, of the WCAL, which is probably the best league in the Bay Area. And even them, I mean, the the number one school in our area, they only had one guy go to Division One. The rest of them all went to to junior college. So that was kind of that was kind of the goal. Was like, hey, I want to play college baseball. Well, that means you're going to junior college. See what happens there. Um, from there, it was from there it was you know, hey man, I'm I'm working hard. I'm putting up good numbers. Um, you know, I think I can play. I'm being told I can play Division One. So I mean, that became the goal and. Um, you know, that might have been the goal. I, I don't know if I would have how I would have felt about going to Division Two or NAIA um, after junior college. But um, I mean, the whole time, I mean, day one, it was, hey, man, let's let's try and go to a Division One school something nice. If, eventually, I mean, it turned into like, you know, I thought I kind of had a pick of what I could do. So I was like, hey, I'd really like to stay on the West Coast, something like that. That was kind of where it came into into that. But um, you know, I shoot high school. I mean, Division One was so far away, man. It was. It was just something that, you know, it was kind of a dream come true when I was actually starting to realize, hey, I could actually maybe do this. Were there any, like, as a kid, like, camps, stuff that you went D1 and and could have seen that? Or did you never never do any of that stuff? Yeah, no, I mean... Um, like, do you think that's a good avenue or route for, for some kids? If you think you're D1, you know, we've encouraged kids to go, you know, pick your... And even Coach Basil, pick your three, four, five schools and go to their camp. Yeah, no, I think that is uh, from for me personally. I wasn't, I never did that. Um, I actually at the, at the junior college skyline that I went to, they had summer camps, and that was more just to get better and to have fun during the day and stuff like that, and play baseball, and probably for my parents to get me out of the house. But <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Stanford holds a great camp, um, you know, in my area, but that that was about it. I mean, that was kind of my only option. Um, and then uh, actually one, a couple of my good friends, they actually as sophomores came out to a Fresno State camp back when they used to do put you in the dorms and stuff like that. And they loved it. I was like, man, like, I don't even think I could do that. I, probably, I don't think I could handle that. Like, um, you know, the guys that are going to those camps are probably pretty good. Um, but as a coach now, I mean, that's that's exactly what I would say. You know, a lot of guys go to these showcases or um, these big kind of like satellite camps where you got a bunch of coaches there. If you've decided, hey, um, which is something I think all, all kids should do. Decide what's important to you, what, what schools offer, what you want to go in the future, whether it's baseball, academics, whatever it is. Pick those schools out and go to their camps because that's really the only time where you're going to be, you know, for us, you're in front of the head coach, you're in front of the pitching coach, you're in front of um, 
uh, the volunteer coach in front of everybody at that school. So, I mean, that's really the best chance you have to go ahead, go ahead, go out there and impress them. And not to say that those other things don't do anything for you, but I guarantee if you go to a camp like, you know, a camp or a showcase, that coach is going to say, Hey, we want to get you on our campus in front of our people. Um, so it's kind of just, you know, might as well skip that part and just go ahead, pick out a good school and, and take your shot. Yeah. Cause if you're going to a showcase and stuff, you better be almost like the top five mm -hmm. on, of that showcase or whatnot. You know, anybody and everybody can go to a, a school's camp and, you know, you have a good day that day. Now you're on the radar and, you know, they might not, or you, you know, you might not hit as well, but you run a six, four sixty, or, you know, something you could work with or, um, yeah, I think we've encouraged that more now. Uh, they didn't have that stuff when I know when we were growing up, they didn't have those, you know, college camps. No, and much. there's some elite stuff out there. And, and <clears throat> you know, with the travel ball stuff, uh, you know, there is opportunities through travel ball. I just think it's you don't know who's there. Yeah. You know, you can't pick and choose who gets to come watch you yeah. or if anybody at all gets to come watch you. Right. So at least in this, you're in control, right? I'm putting myself... Uh, where I want to be in the next four or five years. That's, you know, that's all. I think, I mean, travel ball is definitely great to get extra games, and there's some really good teams around here, uh, and there's tons of talent, but I just feel like, you know, if you're a 15-, 16-year-old kid and you're you're looking to play college baseball, you need to find a way to get into these camps and, and figure out where you want to go and not devote all summer and every dime into travel ball. Yeah, if that's you all. Think, and a lot of these kids, you know, it's the D1 or bus or pro ball. Well, this draft just kind of proved itself. If you're not one of the top 50 high school players, I know it was only five rounds, but if you're not one of the top 50 high school players, then you're not going to get drafted. If you're not the best on your team. Yeah, exactly. You be, should probably go. I mean, the, the, some of the talent around here the last couple of years, even this year, and some of the kids going Division One. Yeah. There's a couple dudes that I thought, man, they have an outside shot of getting drafted out of high school. Yeah. And... They might have been the best players on their team, but even that didn't guarantee anything. I mean, you have to be uh, above and beyond, you know, I get what you think in your mind. You know what I mean? It's, I don't know, just some of these guys, it's just a different animal. Like when Labby's telling you, this kid's out taking live ABs, you know, how many of our local kids were doing that during the draft that yeah. are potential draft picks? Yeah. Probably zero. Yeah. And uh, I actually was listening to that on the way over. And, um, you know, I've seen the kid York that Labby drafted, man. And I've never been to anything or talked to anybody that said, hey, that's not the best kid on the field. He just constantly is. And um, talked to a lot of people about um, just that kid. And he was never in play for uh, for me to, to recruit or anything like that. And, um, you know, but he's just a kid that everybody tells you about. Like, I'm like, man, well, that'd be great. But he ain't, he ain't coming here or something like that because he's already he's already signed. But. Um, yeah, man, kids like that are, you know, they're rare. And, um, you know, going back to the travel ball thing, you know, travel balls, travel ball is tough, man. It's expensive. I got a lot of friends that, that are into the travel ball organizations and, um, and they, I think a lot of them do it right and everything. But, um, as far as exposure, you're, you're exactly right, man. It's, it's so hard to, Hey, we're going to this tournament this weekend. Well, there might not be one division one coach there, you know, and then what are you, what are you doing it for? So that's, that's why I think the camp route is actually pretty good. Yeah, um, yeah. No, we, we we've said it a bunch of times before too. Always pay attention to the calendar. No, yeah. No, no one these guys. Calendar. No one these guys can be out and about because, again, getting extra work and going to play a tournament, do it. That's cool. Yeah. But if, I'm just saying, if you're using it as a vehicle to be recruited, no one the when these college coaches, whether it's D one, two, three, I don't know what the rules are all the way down. Um, just know when they're going to be out and about. That's all. You know, yeah. I, I don't want to knock travel ball because, like I said, around our area. There's some pretty good travel ball, and there's some good players around here. Um, but I just think for for recruiting purposes, you know, just know know all the details when you're getting right. into that. Um, so you get to state. Um, you know, what was that first experience like getting out there in the fall, getting in touch with Bates, um, you know, and as being a, a PO, I don't know if we've had a PO yet uh, at Fresno State anyway. Um, just kind of talk about, you know. Yeah, Dylan. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Dylan. Dylan, yep. Um, just your experience getting in there and get initiated to, to D1 baseball. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny. Like I said, I was listening to that last episode that you guys had uh, on the way over, and uh, and um, Pappy and uh, Labby were talking about Bulldog time. 
So I, I was I was never a guy to show up five minutes before or anything like that. You know, I know I got to do what I got to do. But my first day, we had, we had a meeting um, the first day and then the next day practice. And uh, I walked in probably 30 or 40 minutes early and there guys are already dressed. They're on the field. They're putting screens out. They're hitting. They're, they're doing early work. And uh, Bates was sitting in the in the um, dugout and he's like, he's like almost practice time. And I was like, man, I, I better I better hustle up. Um, but uh, no, it was uh, my first first uh, experience really was, um, you know, just kind of getting how they how they did things at that time. Matt Curtis was the pitching coach. So trying to read the practice plan was was even tough, something that I'm not that I wasn't used to at the time. And um, so anyway, I go on. It's my my day to throw my bullpen and uh, I'm throwing them throw probably my first five pitches. I'm just kind of getting loose. And uh, Basil sitting in the back, which he, he doesn't normally do. You know, he, he's usually staying out of the bullpen and he's, he'd rather be in the cage or on the field hitting or something. But so he's back there. I think he kind of wanted to know what what, you know, what kind of player he had. And um, and I throw a couple and they're kind of right at the chest protector. He goes and then he stops me. He's like, hey, you want to? You want to pitch? And I was like, I'm thinking I'm doing great. Uh, I, threw no, I threw five strikes. I'm like, I'm like, uh, and I'm just kind of looking. I was like, you pitch like that, and I'm expecting him to say like, that's what we want. And he goes, you pitch like that, you're gonna be sitting on the uh, sitting on the bench by the water cooler. You're gonna throw about five innings this year. Get the ball down. So I finished my bullpen, and I'm sitting there, and um, and we got uh, we're going double barrel. We had a freshman pretty highly touted freshman from the area throwing on, on one mound and then a senior throwing on the other mound. Uh, the freshman was throwing, he was grunting, he's throwing as hard as he can, balls up, um, uh, off speed was a little flat. The, the senior was over here, probably going about 80%, just sinking it and, and throwing it right at, we put a string right at the bottom of the strike zone um, and just hitting that. And he goes, you know the difference between these two guys? He's like, their stuff's the same. That freshman is gonna throw about seven innings this year that guy's going to throw about 80. And I was like, all right, well, I guess that, that's that's what you want. You want someone that's going to command the zone and things like that. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was a quick quick lesson into uh, into what Bates wants out of his pitchers right there. He's not intimidating, is he? Uh, yeah, man. I mean, shoot. He, <laughs> How was that <laughs> in the bullpen with him right behind you? Like? Um, that part was fine. You know, I, I was just still really feeling him out. But it's like after, you know, any time really when you're on the field and he comes up behind you and he kind of slaps you on the back, man. I mean, shoot, you 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 go forward about three feet after he hits you. So, um, you know, he's he's always been, been good like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I mean, he's – He's not one to mince words, especially with the pitchers. I mean, he's hard on the pitchers, but the thing the thing about that is, and uh, Coach Rousey kind of made that a point to us one year. He's like, hey, man, uh, at the time, I think he only had uh, Steve Susdorf was the only major league hitter. He's like, you got, he named off about five pitchers. And he's like, you know why those guys are in the big leagues? He's like, because they pitched under Coach, Coach Batesel. He's tough on them. No one else is ever going to be that tough on you. And expect more out of you, and and you know he just really he gets you gets you a lot tougher to be on the mound and handle, you know, a game where you're pitching in front of three thousand people and and things like that. So he's a tremendous motivator when it comes to the pitching side of it. Even though he's not, you know, he doesn't doesn't care about your mechanics or anything. So um, you know he definitely he brings a lot to the table as far as preparing the pitching staff. Um, so like we said, you had a, a solid solid career at Fresno State and. Did you just jump right in as a, a starting guy? I mean, obviously, with your first year was was you say eleven and one? No, that was his uh, last year. Last year, <clears throat> but he was nineteen and three overall, overall. In two years. Yeah, uh, he had eight starts this uh, junior year. Yeah, when I well, when I was a junior, I, I came in trying to be a starter, and to open the season, actually, I was I was labeled the closer, um, and I actually had a little bit of trouble there. We had our first two series. I think I. Um, I got a save. I got a. I got a win uh, out of the pen, and then I think I pit. It was our op- our second weekend. We're on the road. I think I pitched, you know, a Saturday, and then we played the weekend after. And I didn't pitch. You know, we were just kind of not in that situation for the games, and di- so I hadn't pitched in over a week. It was like I think the next Sunday, and I came in, didn't do great. Um, came in again um, against. Uh, I won't forget it against Santa Clara, and uh, came in with a big lead and. And me and another guy, we actually got uh, we got hit pretty hard and ended up barely winning the game. And uh, after that, kind of went into a middle relief role. Um, and actually, that was kind of where my one um, my one run in with Bates kind of happened. Um, basically, he was they kind of they were calling out our pitches, so we were trying to figure out why it was. And he said, "Hey, man, go uh, 
you got to watch your film. We had a long bus ride to San Diego or something. You got to you got to watch your film and uh, find out what they're what they're seeing. You know, is it out of the gloves? Is it is it uh, are they catching your grip? Um, are you doing something different? And um, long story short, I couldn't get to the get to the film. So I ended up not watching it and he called me down. Um, we got to San Diego about to play Fullerton, I think. And uh, he goes, Hey, did you, you watch film? I was like, Hey, I, I couldn't find it. You know, he had actually, he went down a day early to, to go recruit. So he wasn't even around. So, and I thought I kind of exhausted all my options of how to get the film. And uh, I said, you know, no, I didn't, I didn't get the film. And he's like, well, Hey, it's right there. You should have, you should have watched it. And, um, and he said, so you're not coming to the game today. You're going to stay in the hotel, me and the other, the other pitcher. And, um, that was, you know, it was, it was harsh. You know, my parents, they drove down from, from the Bay area, eight hour drive to San Diego. And, uh, and to, for me to tell them, Hey, yeah, I'm not going to be at the game today. Like that was, that was pretty embarrassing, but never did it again. You know, it was a, it was a lesson learned. And, um, but anyway, uh, I just want to throw that in there, but anyway, um, you know, ended up kind of got into a role where I had a couple, couple bad games, man. And, um, uh, really ended up uh kind of getting in that up up three down three role where you know the game's kind of either out of reach we're trying to save pitching or something like that and um and so i did that for a couple weeks uh started doing a little bit better and then um actually i think bates told the story on on his episode we were playing at bakersfield who was they were really good those couple years that i was at state and um danny muno hit a ball off his foot and the umpire called it fair and bates went out and argued and I, if, if Bates told this story, it was when Muno took his – he takes his sock off to show that he's got a red mark on his foot and the ball hit him. But anyway, so so Bates had brought me in in like the fourth. This happened in the fifth, and I had never gone more than like two, three innings. Bates gets tossed. Uh, Curdy ends up starting to uh, control the rest of the game, and I'm throwing good, throwing good, and I'm expecting like, oh, okay, I went my three innings, I'm probably out, uh, and I just kind of rolled with it. And then, um, you know, ended up throwing five innings to get the win, and the next week we started um, – we started a uh, conference against Hawaii and uh, went out and pitched uh, probably the game of my career at Fresno State. No, no. Yeah. No, no to start my career. And I could just, I could, I kind of had a high pitch count, but Bates was going to let me, let me roll with it. So, but I could see, man, he was in the dugout. He was like, he was kind of almost waiting for that first hit to be like, all right, we got to get somebody else in there. He's, th- he's throwing too much. But uh, yeah, did that. And then pretty much from there, I was a starter, starter after that, finished the season. Um, into the whack tournament as a starter. We're not going to just gloss over your no hitter, buddy. Yeah. So stop. <laughs> we we know the friends that you guys don't like talking about yourself. I know. I don't have a I don't have a jar here to charge you anything. No. And I'm Bates may let you get away with it now. I don't Maybe. know. But I mean, what do you remember about that day? Even just just getting to the park and. Did you know you were starting before that? Yeah. Yeah, I knew I was starting. Um, uh, you know, they set the rotation ahead of time. Um. We were playing Hawaii, who was, I mean, they were uh, they were doing really well. I mean, they beat some Pac-12 teams, like, um, pretty well. And uh, we came in, and, um, you know, one thing about Fresno State at that time was, um, you know, no matter what sport, you know, the, the whack kind of went through us. I don't, I don't know how many years it had been at that time, but it was, um, shoot, it was probably four or five years of them either winning the tournament, going to the regional, or, or winning the uh, conference outright. So... We roll in there and um, and it was kind of like, hey man, they they were the ones that were probably gonna try and take it from us, and they had a couple good starters, and um, and they threw a, a really good. Le- I think he gave up like two hits, one run, something like that, and I, it might not even been earned. And um, so I was just like, man, I'm just. And they had uh, Colton Wong was their big guy, obviously big leaguer. Uh, their shortstop um, Garcia, who I think he's with the Padres now. Made the big league. He's been in the big leagues for about three, four years now. Um, actually, probably longer than that. And then they had a catcher that uh, I think has had some big league time. So they were, they were plenty good. And um, so you know, I was just trying to get out get out there and really just you know get through a couple innings, something like that, and uh, get it to our bullpen because we were already up two to uh, two games to nothing there. And I was like, well, we got a chance to win the series right now. So uh, just kind of took it inning by inning, and um, you know that kind of just led. Led to the whole thing. How much does that help when another guy's dealing with you? Like you match an inning for inning, and like are you using like that the innings all? are kind of quick. Yeah, yeah. No, like, was, you're, you're trying to outdo him. Like you're dueling each other. Like, no, nah, this fool's not going to beat me this inning. Yeah, no. I mean, I, I honestly, I wasn't even thinking like that at the time. Um, uh, it was a good 
quick paced game and yeah you didn't have much time to really think about too much you know he was kind of in and out in and out in and out and so um you know we were just kind of battling like that and then i think the way that it happened was uh i think our uh I believe it was Garrett Weber. Um, you know, he got on base, maybe even on an air, moved over to second. Um, uh, we hit a ground ball to the right side to go to third with one out, and then um, Steve Detweiler hit a uh, hit a um, sack fly to right field or something uh, to get him in. So we, I don't even think we got a hit in the inning that we that we scored a run. And then um, you know, to end the game, it ended up uh, ended up having a guy on first with one out and. Um, I think it was Coach, Coach Ware, or Coach Curtis, whoever's moving the infielders around, put our put our shortstop a little few steps over in the six hole. Guy hits a line drive right to him. We doubled off the guy at first. Uh, you know, Rivera tagged the bag, and and that was it. I mean, it was a uh, it was a real team team win. You know, you don't really think about like how crucial it is when a guy hits a ball hard that the positioning was right, um, that the game was called correctly, things like that. So um, it didn't settle in for for quite a while for me actually. When did you? Sorry, I was just saying. When did you? Like, hey, I, I'm my yeah, stuff's so I, on today. Like, I just, you know, honestly, I didn't even feel that it, that it was on. It was more like I was just super focused because I, I really wanted to stay in the rotation. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just more like super focused about like I better make these pitches, things like that. It wasn't, you know, I've been there at times when you're just like, man, I'm just I'm releasing the ball. It's got good life. It's going where I want to go. You know, you're not even really thinking about it. But it was more of a, a really focused uh, outing for me. When did you <laughs> did you realize you had a no hitter going? Uh, probably like the fifth or sixth inning. And then like, um, you know, just going, going in the dugout, you know, people walk by here or something, Hey man, good job, whatever, you know, keep it rolling. Uh, guys started to get further and further away from me and, um, and, don't uh, want to jinx it. Did yeah. that make it worse or did it, does yeah. it help you? No, I didn't, I didn't care. I don't really talk to anybody on the, on the bench anyway. So, um, you know, I kind of stay to myself when I'm in the game mode, but, um, yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was more for me rather than focusing on like, oh, they got no hits. It was more like I want to stay in the game, so I better not, you know, do anything to mess that up. So that was, I mean, it was a it was a great experience. You know, did you it's ever a really peak, good team. Did you ever peek up at the scoreboard and be like, man, they they don't have any hits? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shoot. Do you have the baseball? Yeah, I got the baseball at home. Um, I think my my parents have. My dad's got it. Uh, Coach Curtis, Coach Batesel, they uh, they got my dad. This before you know they streamed everything. So my dad's got the game film. Uh, with no sound, my mom she recorded the uh, the ra- Paul Leffler on the radio with it, oh, nice. and they try to kind of sync it up sometimes. And then Coach uh, Coach Curtis and Coach Bates, so they gave our my parents the scorecard afterwards. It was it was a pretty nice thing, pretty cool. That's cool, yeah, well, that is pretty neat. Um, and then you go into your senior year, dominate, and you know before we started recording, Chad was like, "Hey man, this guy, you know, has a legit career and it was a fifteenth round pick." Uh, going into the draft stuff, was there any expectations that you had or conversations that you'd had with anybody and thinking like this is roundabout where it's going to go? And, and then, you know, you I mean, not that 15th round is bad, but, you know, was that I'm sure it's not after the career you had something you expected? Yeah, no, I mean, um, well, I, I knew it was going to happen just because I had had such a such a good year that year. And um, and I filled out a lot of questionnaires, talked to a lot of guys. And uh, the funny thing about it is. Um, there was probably two teams that I didn't fill out anything for. And one of them was the Padres, uh, who ended up taking me. And then I asked the scout later, became friends with him. And, uh, I said, well, Hey, like we didn't really talk. Why'd you take me? He's like, Oh, well, you know, I talked to a couple guys and they, they said you're pretty good. So I, you know, I took a shot. I was like, oh, that, that's all it takes, huh? <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I mean, I didn't really, uh, the, the one thing about it is we had, there was a, another pitcher that I kind of followed from another, from another school senior, just like me had a really good year. Um, but you know, comparing myself to him, I was like, ah, my numbers are better. Um, and, and he got picked up a few rounds before me and I kind of stopped, like, I, I kind of pissed me off. So I stopped really listening. And then, um, the, and then I heard, uh, Fresno state on thing. I'm like, Oh, who, who was that? And then it ended up, it ended up, they repeated it. It was me. And I was like, Oh wow. Like I barely, I barely knew who, who made the pick. It was, it was kind of a, it was just a surreal moment for me. Where were you? I was just at home, you know, there was no. No draft parties for the fifteenth round or anything. Day, <laughs> but I mean, did three. you? Was there a sense of like relief, kind of, at all? Yeah. Or were you kind of just? I went in the fifteenth round. No, man. By the, by that time, I didn't. I didn't really care about the round. It was just the fact that it happened. You know, I didn't. Uh, 
I didn't know too many. Obviously, coming coming to Fresno State, we had a few guys drafted the year before. We had a lot of guys from that team that were going to get drafted. and But I didn't know a lot of guys that, that had got drafted and played professional baseball, just maybe a handful. Um, but, um, yeah, so, I mean, at that time, man, I just, you know, I wanted to – to go let my my parents know, even though they, they were listening, they heard it. Um, and then, you know, Coach Batesel called me right away and congratulated me. And, um, you know, from there, just kind of trying to wrap my head around it. So I didn't really know much. I didn't know I was going to be leaving in three, four days. I didn't know any of that. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, to, you know, to be not recruited, you know, to go through JC um, at a new position, you know, it says a lot. You know, and I think it says a lot about Fresno State, and I think it said a lot, a lot about Coach Batesel. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it's not just hitters that get drafted. You know, they, he puts out all kinds of, you know, every position. Yeah. Um, I think it's a cool story, man. I mean, it's, it's there's no one way to get there, and I think that proves it. Yeah. Um, yeah, one thing about that year, man, even though it, it all kind of culminated to having really good stats and a really good season, um it really started at the beginning. I told you about the my first bullpen I threw my junior year. My first bullpen of my senior year, um, Coach Batesel was there for that. He really wanted to watch the freshman and kind of see if, you know, if you worked out all summer and all that. And um, we had a really, really talented freshman class come in as pitchers. And so I'm watching a few of those guys. And, I mean, I'm you know, there were guys 90, 94. I was, I was you know, maybe 90, give or take, two miles an hour here and there. But And I'm like, man, dude, these freshmen are – are pretty good. There's probably four or five that were really, really good. And then I throw my bullpen, uh, threw a ton of strikes, but, um, you know, didn't, I was like, man, my stuff probably, he probably thinks I didn't do anything. He had me come sit down. He's like, he's like, that's the best pen I've ever seen you throw. You know, everything, every, every pitch had this kind of angle to it and you threw a ton of strikes, you know, which is what we want to see from you. And, and just kind of from there, it was just, you know, every bullpen after that, um, that, that's what I was trying to do. And then stuff started playing up a little bit and, um, coach Rousey who had come in that year, he was just the perfect guy to kind of keep me on that trajectory that I think I had one or two days where I was like, man, like stuff's not good. You know, I'm not throwing the ball where I want. So I've started overthrowing and kind of doing things that I had done that had got me in trouble in the past. And, um, coach Rousey would reel me back in. And then, you know, it just kind of got to the point where I was like, all right, this is the type of pitcher I am. This is what I need to do, you know, 90% of the time to be successful. And, um, and that's really the biggest biggest difference between me as a senior that got drafted and put up great numbers at the Division One level to a, you know, a freshman at Skyline College. It wasn't it wasn't the stuff that played different. It was, you know, what I was trying to do with the baseball and and just being a little bit more mature there. That that really made me, you know, a you know all conference uh, player and a guy that got got drafted. Consistency, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Then so Maturity. you go you go play and uh, we were talking also. You know, you're you're professional career was just odd on how they they used you and sending you up and down and uh just kind of get into you know your time there and then ultimately getting into coaching yeah um my first year we had uh uh i was sent to the with the padres we were at um the eugene emerald uh which plays at the university of oregon and we probably had about like shoot four or five first rounders from the last few years that were on that team and a really good team and um i was coming from being a starter to being a reliever um and actually um you know we just had a had a little bit of trouble kind of going from hey i get seven days off to hey, i might be pitching every day as a reliever um but had, had a really good time there had a had a decent season to start off um i think that team even set a record for the most consecutive wins like 13 or 14 in minor league uh baseball but it was a quick little um quick little introduction into pro baseball and, and the grind of it. And, um, and then the next year, um, the Padres right out of the gate, they had like a 20, um, they had like a 20 inning game, 18 inning game where they used a bunch of relievers. And so what they did was they called up a bunch of relievers from AAA and they said, so they said, Hey, you're going to go up to AAA, um, and kind of fill some, fill some innings or whatever. And then, so the first day I got there, they're like, you're not going to pitch. And I, we, we got smoked. So the next, so I go in the manager's office after that and he gets, says, Hey, um, like you were starting college, you started last year. Can you start tomorrow? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Like, like no problem. And, um, so the, f- the funny part about this story is, uh, watched, watched a guy who was the number one prospect in baseball. I'm like, all right, let's see what this guy's about watching the day before. And he just looks like a man among boys, like, uh, like the, um, you know, the, the senior at the best school, you know, in the area 
playing with the freshman team. Like he was that much better than everybody. So he's leading off. So the first guy that I end up facing um, in AAA is Mike Trout. So <laughs> welcome to yeah, <laughs> welcome to AAA. Right, right. So um, and he, like I said, he just went off the day before. It must have been three for four. Just you know, just killed it. And so. I get him like 0-2. He works it to like a 3-2 count. And I'm like, man, like, you know, I got a chance to get this guy out. Like, I'm just going to challenge him. And so he hits a pop-up. And I'm like looking at him. I'm like, all right, you know, that's uh, routine. And where we were playing, the fence was about 4-10. He hit about 4-08, something like that. So ended up getting him out the first time. Uh, went three or four innings. Ended up facing him again. He got a push-bump base hit. Man, he just the fastest guy I've ever seen on the field just flew right by me. And, um, as I was trying to get over uh, on a, on the push and, and he, so he got a hit. So he's hitting 500 against me in uh, in pro ball, but, but you could tell people he was scared of you. Yeah, pretty he much. Bun- man. He yeah. They yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I, th- I think it was actually a, like a sack push. Like he wasn't even bunting for a hit and he just went right by me. But, um, so I threw like three or four innings there and then they said, all right, well, we can't use it for, for a few days. So, they ended up calling another guy up, and then you're going to go down to Lake Elsinore, which was the high A, high a um, team for the Padres. Uh, spent the rest of that year there. Um, the next year um, ended up breaking with Lake Elsinore again. Um, probably about the second weekend, ended up having shoulder surgery um, on my rotator cuff. Uh, rehabbed it for about three months, and then they sent me to AAA. Um, did about the last two or three weeks of the season there. Um, and, uh, and then ended up getting released between, uh, between AAA and then the, the next spring training. Just crazy. You, do you think it had something to do with your, the shoulder? Yeah, definitely. I mean, and, and age. Yeah. I mean, cause that a lot of people don't understand the age you could be 22 and tell you you're, you know, you're old, but mm-hmm. you were a fifth year senior, had an ACL surgery, you know, there's so many factors that people well, and, don't and, think and about. As a business business side of it, yeah. they weren't that invested yeah. financially into you either, right? I mean, but I mean, what was your line in that one AAA game you started? Um, Do you remember? She, not really, because it, it wasn't great. But I think it was like it was like three innings, three runs. But I mean, they were. Uh, I mean, that's something that that lineup that they had uh, was. I mean, they had Trout, they had Cole Calhoun, uh, Jorge Cantu, who who had a few really good uh years in the big leagues um pitched against um uh garrett richards um who ended up i mean he was a phenom for a little while um and then uh yeah i mean so i think it was like three innings three runs something like that um but you know the funny part was was everything that they hit hard got caught and it was it was a few of the the broken bat stuff that got that kind of got me um which you know i kind of hung my hat on there but um, it was, it was, de- you know, once you, once you see a guy like Mike Trout and you're like, I can get him out. Like that's a lot of confidence for somebody like, and I still tell, tell our pitchers today, you know, you can get, you can get the best hitter out, you know, once it's pretty, you know, it's pretty tough for that guy to get a hit off you every time, but you know, you can get him out once. And so you can get everybody out once, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, are they going to get you the other nine out of 10 times? But, um, you know, it was a big confidence boost for me for that triple A game. And so after you're done, I mean, is, is coaching something you'd ever thought about doing or i mean was that the the first choice uh yeah yeah i wanted to stay in the game um something that like you know growing up where i grew up we all kind of you know wasn't so much travel ball but everybody kind of played for the same coaches and i felt like we all really had kind of the same knowledge you talk hitting you're all gonna have the same verbiage you're gonna do all that sort of thing um so like when i would talk with my buddies you know it was just like we're all having the same conversation whether um you know you played high school didn't play high school whatever it was and so coming to Fresno State and and getting in with that coaching staff and hearing how they approach the game and and the things that they were trying to do from a winning winning game standpoint strategy standpoint different types of practices um, I was like you know I, I think I got a little bit more to bring to the table now so um, you know after Fresno State I kind of figured you know I, I would want to get get into coaching at some point point. Um, and so uh, I talked to, to uh, Dina Namikos, the head coach at Skyline College said hey man what do you, what do you think I should do He's like, well, you can come coach here. You should go go get your master's degree. If you want to coach in college, you should try and get your master's degree. So started doing that, started that program, um, did did a year at, uh, at um, Skyline Junior College, ended up actually making the playoffs for the first time in about five years and came up and played Fresno, Fresno City, who was the two seed, and um, almost had them, but, but they pulled it out in three games. And then um, 
went back to Skyline, finished my finished my master's, uh, ended up doing three years at Skyline College. And then um, uh, Matt Curtis again, actually, uh, he said, hey, you know, there's this was after my second year. He said, hey, there's a um, uh, there's an opportunity to coach uh, to be a volunteer at one of these schools in the Bay Area. A uh, good friend of mine over at Stanford is they they just lost their volunteer. You should apply. So I applied. Um, Rusty Filter was his name. Uh, he he called me. He said, "Hey, we already we've already filled it. You know, it's been filled for like three weeks before it even came out." Um, but you know, let me. I'll take your number down. I'll have you do some camps. So I ended up uh, working uh, one of the Stanford pitching camps under under Coach Filter and didn't really talk to him too much. And he ended up. Um, you know, he just, you know, thanks for, thanks for helping out. Uh, here's some things you should do for your career. And then ended up finishing the next year at Skyline College, going on my third year. And then um, he called me out of the blue, said, hey, I'm, uh, I'm in line to get this, this job over at Santa Clara University. Um, I'm putting together a, a staff for my, my interview portion. Are you interested? Would you want to do it? And so I kind of jumped on that. Um, you know, I knew that that was something that if I wanted to get into Division One or even really, I did it for like a separator. You know, if I ever wanted to do junior college again, I could say I could, you know, coach at the Division One level. Um, so I jumped on that and, um, and and worked under Coach Filter, who I believe is one of the best pitching guys on the West Coast, probably in college baseball. Um, so I got to work under him for a couple of years. He had it was a it was a really good introduction to college baseball. Um, you know, junior college is a little bit different in the preparation and, and things like that, but. I mean, he had comprised a, a coaching staff that was just amazing. Um, and, you know, I mean, my first day I, I was talking to one of the other coaches and he showed me some of the some of just the charts that he uses. And I'm like, man, like, OK, no, no wonder you're where you're at. Like he uh, one of those, you know, a couple of those guys that you're just like, man, how do how do I have 24 hours a day? You have 24 hours a day. How do you accomplish that? And I accomplish whatever it is I do. Um, so it was a super quick introduction there. Um Ended up doing two years uh, at uh, Santa Clara and then as the volunteer. And then um, Santa Clara is actually on the um, on the quarter system. So they hadn't even started yet. And um, and then, you know, one day Coach Bates will call me and said, hey, we have an opening. Are you interested? And uh, really just really just jumped on it to come come back and be a part of his staff. What was that called? Like, like, how was it an easy decision to? um leave where you were at yeah i mean you know it's it's you know i had a great rapport with uh with the other coaches there and it it's uh you know it sucks when you when you move on and stuff and the players i really respect the players in that program and um and how hard they work um but i mean it's really it's a no-brainer when you can go from being a volunteer to a full-time assistant and um especially somewhere like you know i know i knew bates i've known ovi for for a long time now and um i know the program and take a lot of pride in the program so it was probably one of the few places that I really did want to want to leave for any uh and then you know obviously it's a little different as a player and coach can you talk about the adjustment you know you know debates Bates, yeah on the field as a coach now yeah um well the the biggest thing is when you're a player you're getting the message you're just like all right um you know I don't know if he just you know thought of this and he's just rolling with it and you know that's why he's saying what he's saying and that's why we do what we do um, but now, you know, being in those pre-practice meetings and really knowing the direction of the program and knowing all the thought and time that, that the whole coaching staff kind of takes um, to doing things and, and every little thing that you do, whether it's the talk before, if it's the practice planning, you know, two weeks ahead of a game, if it's uh, just kind of, um, you know, seeing how practice is going and how we're going to change those things. Um, you know, that's, you know, now I'm, now I'm really understanding and I'm understanding why it's happening, um, rather than just it's happening to me. Um, and then, you know, getting into other things like the recruiting side of it and getting into, um, you know, just things that I, as a pitcher never really had to deal with, you know, I didn't have to deal with base running. I didn't have to deal with the infield play, but, um, you know, just kind of getting his whole insight on that and Ovi's inside and, and having coach Ware there who I played for and, um, you know, there's there's just so much good dialogue that goes on between the coaching staff that, um, you know, it's it's fun for me every day just to be in there. And the recruiting side, are you excited yeah. to get into that? I am. I am. It's been um, more anyways, more. Involved yeah. Is with it. Yeah. No, there's definitely from the from the volunteer petition that I held at Santa Clara. There's only so much you can do um, versus now. I mean, now there's you know, I'm you know, can go off campus, can do a whole bunch of things. Um, uh, but 
um, before I came to Fresno State, uh, we only had about a week or two um, before the dead dead period hit where you can't go off campus. And then we were only going for about two two weeks again uh, before COVID hit. So I uh, didn't really get to get out there as much as I wanted to. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm really excited to, you know, uh, be able to be at some of these other events and things like that and, you know, really get to know, you know, uh, a lot more of the players in the area. Yeah, I think there's so much talent here. And now with, you know, Ovi and you recruiting, I think it's going to be, I don't know, I think we're going to get so much more of the Central Valley in there. I know he does a lot, but I think we're going to get more now from, you know, Bakersfield all the way up to, you know, the Bay Area. And I know that's not the Valley, but there's so much good baseball in, in the Bay Area, you know, high school wise. And then junior college, you were in the, one of the top JUCO conferences in the state. So, um, yeah, what, can we just go into like what you guys are kind of looking for? I know we've done it with OV and Bates, but, um, you know, you guys all have a different, a little different of what, what you look for and, and, um, you know, how you approach recruiting. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, like you said, I mean, you guys have talked to Ovi and Bates, and it's really, it's really um, Bates's um, philosophy on on recruiting that we kind of go off. I mean, we'd love to keep every every Valley kid in the Valley, but you know, it just doesn't happen. So, you know, sometimes you got to go to a little bit wider base. Um, you know, one one thing that I, I really really like about Coach Batesel's um, philosophy, and I've I've seen it a lot in the past few weeks with COVID and the shortened draft and uh, and things like that, is you know. Um, a lot of these schools, you know, they're they're committing guys as freshmen. You know, there's guys that are committed that have never even played a college or a high school baseball game, um, and you're kind of just going off. Well, he sh- he should be good. He should do this. Should do that. Um, one thing about Coach Bates is he likes to see the kids play. He likes to see when they you know start to struggle a little bit. You know, give them time to actually have a little bit of a high school career um, rather than just hey man we'll get them. And um, you know, some of these some some schools um, you know. A lot of them successful too, you know. I, I wouldn't badmouth them or anything, but you know, it's 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 terrible to see a kid that, hey, I've been committed to this school, and you know, my senior year comes right before signing day, or in this case, you know, even up to like last week, I heard about a kid that, oh, well, hey, man, now I can't go here because they've, you know, it's either been an over recruitment or, um, you know, the the scholarship money has changed or something like that, and it's just uh, that's probably my favorite thing about Coach Basil's philosophy is give kids time, a chance to develop and, um, you know, and then, and then kind of make a decision if, if it's a good fit for the kid, are we the right fit for them? Are they a right fit for us? I think that's something that a lot of people, um, maybe don't think about. They, they kind of look at the name of the school and they're excited about it and they're like, all right, I'm in, you know, without really knowing enough about the school. Yeah. Or who's coming in, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, or the academic side of it. Yeah. There's a lot of things to figure in. Um, you know, all, before we keep going, though, I do wanted to, you know, talk about the third paid assistant. Um, you know, something you wanted to bring up, uh, being an assistant coach and and being through, you know, a volunteer. Just kind of talk about again, and especially now with the numbers about to increase, uh, as far as player rosters go, mm-hmm. uh, the effect that a third a paid assistant would have. Yeah, um, you know, and and. With, with the whole COVID thing and budgets being uh, impacted, you know, it's probably less and less likely that, that that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, but, you know, firsthand experience, um, and I know Chad's been there, you know, pro baseball is a grind. Um, you know, a lot of people think college baseball is a grind. I see it all the time. Uh, you know, I'm just out here grinding, you know, getting work in. I mean, you know, practicing's fun, you know, hit, hitting the weight room. That, that's pretty fun. The biggest grind I've ever had to go through is is the volunteer assistant role. And I was fortunate enough to be at a, at a place where um, Coach Filter, he did everything in his power to get me um, as much money as he could through camps and through other avenues and to get me ready to be a, a full time assistant. But there's a lot of other places that, you know, you're you're out there, you're doing the field work, um, you know, you're out there doing the field work, you're driving, you're there from nine in the morning to you know, the end of practice at night, um, you're doing just so much and for, for nothing, for the hope that, you know, you know, a position will open up at another school and things like that. So, um, you know, that's just a little bit about it. It's, it's such, it's a, such a tough job and going to the NCAA, I mean, uh, baseball has the worst coach to player ratio. Um, 
And it's just, you know, I don't think it's fair to the players. I don't think it's fair to the guys in that, those positions of the volunteer coach that, hey, you have to um, kind of basically pay your dues for, you know, an un- unknown amount of time and for very little, very little money and try to, you know, be a good coach and be totally invested in a program. And, you know, when you got so many other things to worry about, it, it's very tough. It's a very tough role. And, um, you know, Fresno State, we were fortunate enough to have uh, Pat Ware, who just, you know, he's been in the game almost 20 years being your volunteer assistant. That's that's awesome. But there's so many more guys out there that are just young trying to get in it. And, and that's the biggest thing I think that ends coaching careers is having to stay in it. You know, it's it's my it's doable for a year or two. But I mean, I don't know where I'd be if I wouldn't have been at Fresno State, if I would have still been in that volunteer assistant role in this situation. I think it's I think it's going to be really, really tough for some guys um, to stay in the game. Yeah, we've had a few guys talk about I think it was Coach uh, Eager, just saying like the the college they're losing guys to pro ball. Yeah, you know we've talked about it on here before, and it's like they got to go where the job's at, you mm-hmm. know, where they can get paid, and you know you might see that more. I don't know, right? but with the situation now, I would just the numbers are going to increase, and that ratio is going to grow, and yeah. not just baseball, softball too. Um, you know, I don't know when they're supposed to vote on that again. I think it's another year. Yeah, I, I thought they said twenty twenty one, but. I don't know. It needs to pass. Yeah, I hope it does. Yeah, I, it it keep uh, get more guys in the game. You know, and I think that's what you know. Older guys too that have knowledge. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm not saying the young guys don't, but I'm saying to get a, you know, sometimes the volunteer, like you said, it's a guy trying to get in that's going to start learning stuff. When if you have the third paid, you might be able to get a guy that's been in it a while or right knowledgeable. Yeah, and it, it you know not everybody wants to work for nothing yeah basically you know it's hard to find coaches already you know to ask somebody to volunteer you know and to do what you can to get them paid it's that's probably not easy either no no it's not i mean it's uh i'm sure it's a tough conversation that that coaches have when they have to fill it i mean my situation i was just ready to hop on it and and be in a division one uh program again um and i'm sure that's a lot of the appeal but you know to somebody that's maybe been at another there's a lot of division one programs that, you know, the coaching staff gets changed and now a full time assistant goes into being a volunteer just to stay in. And, um, you know, that happens, you know, every year, I'm sure. And it's it's tough, it's really tough. Yeah. Before we uh, before we finish, you know, I want to kind of talk about, I mean, whatever there is to, to report on. I mean, you know, you had one guy get uh, drafted or assigned Free agent, a, yeah. out of after the draft. Um, you know, so it looks like you're going to have. Yeah, another legit squad coming back. Um, you know, is there anything you could say about this year's team and, and excited for next year? And even though there may be a shortened schedule, I don't even know if we're too sure on what they're going to do yet for the Mountain West, but anything you could touch on? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, first of all, congratulations. Uh, Jaime Arias, he was our uh, Friday night starter this year. Um, he signed with the Indians um, and he's going to start a pro career. And, um, you know, he's, he's been a great bulldog. I think he was a freshman All-American, um, and then he was an All-American last year as a, as a team's closer. Um, and uh, he did a great job, and then he was our Friday night guy this year to start the year. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, you know what? I was I was probably more excited for this 2020 season than, than uh, any season I've been a part of as a coach just because I felt like we were, we were a pretty young team, pretty – inexperienced a little bit just because you know that that 2019 team was was so good and had so many guys drafted and um you know i just felt like hey man this team is we're already doing pretty well but it was just every game we were getting better man and 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 more guys getting at bats and things like that it was uh it was going to be fun i think in the end um to to get to the the mountain west tournament um hopefully and and compete to get to the regionals um but uh, yeah, no. Next next year, I mean, we're excited. You know, uh, Coach Overland, Batesel, P- Coach Ware, uh, Coach Clark, going back to the the year before, they did a great job with this recruiting class. Um, very excited about the guys that are coming in. And like you said, we didn't we didn't lose much. Uh, Ryan Sullivan, uh, senior grad student, he he also he graduated. He's going to move on, but um, you know, he had been a bulldog for five years. Um, so we have we hadn't really lost too much, and um, so we're excited. And and it's kind of what Coach Batesel wants. He always wants a an experienced team. Uh, he calls them old, uh, but I'd say experienced. And um, I think it's going to be fun. And yeah, I think we can make a real run at this, you know, trying to win another Mountain West championship, which is what we, we try to do every year. And, um, you know, I love how he schedules. I mean, he schedules right too. 
Yeah. Uh, your guys' schedule to start was no joke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, um, we, we had a tough schedule, you know. Um, you know, we played Arizona State to start the uh, – or, or right before COVID ended, and, I mean, they were top ten, and they were the real deal. You saw they had five or six guys drafted in that five-round window. Uh, they they were good, man. We were going to Oklahoma State, yeah, so who's pretty good. You're about to get on a plane that like three days later to go to. Well, we, we were yeah, on the did, plane. Yeah. We were on the plane when uh, when the COVID announcement hit, and they they said, "Hey, um, shoot, I was I don't know why my phone ended up getting service, and I got a message from Ovi, and um, and uh, it just said, "Hey, we're turning around when you get to Denver. Uh, you know, we're gonna have to. We'll, hopefully, we'll have something in place. But um, yeah, I mean, we were in the air when it happened, and." Uh, but yeah, we were going there, and then we were getting into Mountain West, which was great. Uh, played University of Washington, uh, UC Irvine, which had a you know preseason All American on the mound Friday night uh, that we ended up uh, we were able to beat. I think Nate Timian hit a home run off him to to kind of put us ahead there. Um, but yeah, no, I mean it was exciting, um, and we you know we had we had a lot more to go. Um, you know, I know that you know next year probably there's going to be a lot of budget issues. Um, you know, whether it's taking games away from us and and you know. Uh, contests and um, you know we're allowed to have um, you know an unlimited amount of players uh, based on the NCAA but you know what a lot of people don't know is you know that that costs a lot of money and especially we'll be getting some budget issues coming up too I'm sure um, one thing I didn't I didn't realize was like oh well we're not playing so we're not spending money so we're not going to be in too big of a hole but you know losing the uh, March Madness and um, you know possibly uh, you know something going on with football I mean that's that's very detrimental to to the amount of money that that all colleges are going to get. So, um, you know, our budget is going to be extremely affected probably, and um, it's going to be it's going to be a new uh, kind of a just a uncharted territory for for college baseball next year and all sports really. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. I just I'm ready to get back to, you know, baseball. Apparently, there's uh, was the announcement yesterday that the MLB is going to have their shortened season. So we'll just. We'll see, I guess. Um, but I'm ready for the dogs to come back, too. My daughter keeps asking me about going to see a Bulldogs game. So, um, you know, I'm excited to come back. I know Chad and I, we love going out there. And uh, you guys have been really, really good to us, Coach Batesel and, and Ovi. Um, you know, it's, it's fun to talk to you guys not on the podcast as well. And, uh, Greg, I just wanted to say thanks, man. I appreciate you doing this. Um, Chad? Anything else? Yeah, just appreciate it. You guys are great, great coaching staff, and just keep doing what you guys are doing. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, guys. I mean, I've, uh, you know, when I first got this job, I was uh, commuting. I'd go home to the Bay Area once a week, um, you know, three-hour three hour ride a couple times, and I listened to a lot of your guys' podcasts, got me through a lot of uh, long rides. And, um, you know, you guys, like I said earlier, man, you guys had some great, uh, great people on here, man. I, I enjoy every time Labby's on, um, you know, some of the other coaches that you guys have had from some other schools. Um won't mention them because I don't want to give them any publicity, but you know, they've done a great job. <laughs> they've done a great job too, man. And it's, uh, you know, something that I listen to is kind of being in the, being in the life. And I'm like, man, you know, that's, that's a really good point. It's, it's a lot of good things for, for high school guys to know and, and players that want to play at the college level. And, you know, it's something I wish I had when I was in my area and something I wish I had, you know, growing up. So you guys are doing a great job. Cool, man. I appreciate that. We it's, hope they're listening. Yeah, we try, we try, we try to spread the word. And if you're out there, you know, share it and, and, get it to the parents and coaches and, and as many people as we can get it to. And I, pre we've had a lot of really good supporters and they continue to support and it's fun uh, just to see this stuff on Twitter and Facebook and all that. And uh, we do, we appreciate everybody that supports the show, but uh, we'll keep plugging along, man. We got some more, some more guests lined up and uh, yeah, keep grinding, right? It's a grind. It's a grind. It is. Every day is a grind. <laughs> Uh, we thank you guys uh, for listening, and thanks again for joining us. That's uh, episode 63, Hit or Die Podcast. Hit or Die.